what chapters have done. Uh, I've been on the program committee for several years, and when I give grades to lectures, one of the most important grades is if the lecture can show other people if that they can do the same thing in their own content. And this is the purpose of this talk. Not to show you the cool pictures, but to convince you that all of you can do these things wherever you are. And uh, that's what we are trying to do. Some brief introduction, we are talking about chapters, which are um, associations in various countries that should do what should, uh, help the foundation in doing what it is doing. But more importantly, the purpose of the chapters is to help each and every one of us to do the cool project. They have no other purpose, in my opinion. We don't have to be. Ludovic um, started this tradition of this talk. Um, I think it was his idea to originate, I don't know how many years ago. I joined him several years ago. It was exhausting, more than 100 hours of work. Uh, on the way to Washington, we sat on the bus for many hours. And uh, this year, I offered a volunteer to do it instead of him. And doing it alone made me understand that it's even harder. And I think we should all, first of all, give a clap to Ludwig, who did this for the past three or four years. And <laughs> very hard. This is the map of the chapter, the map, map of Wikipedia, Wikimedia movement world. Actually, we celebrate our existence from one Wikimania to another, Wikimania year, Wikipedia year is from one Wikimania to another. If this was a new religion, this would be our main holiday, the new year. This is to show you how much the Wikimedia movement has grown throughout the years throughout the world. Since the first Wikimania in Frankfurt, Cambridge, is actually moving, Taipei, Alexandria and Egypt. This is the map of the chapters, Buenos Aires. The map of the chapters at the time of Wikimania, the, the lighter colors are chapters in planning or chapters that are not fully um, legalized yet or acknowledged yet. I need to move faster with the papers. This is Wikimania in Haifa. We got Russia and Australia and Canada and suddenly the world seems blue. Which do all organized. That was my Wikimania in Haifa, not the one before. Yeah. Um, Washington. And somewhere should be Hong Kong, something happened. Hong Kong, okay. Oh, thank you so much for the, the maps because I really don't know how to do these things. Uh, what we did was ask the chapters, all of them, three questions. Thinking three questions would be a simple answer to ask. Uh, what have you been up to this year? What is your course project and what is a cool project by another chapter? I also asked the staff, the foundation, if they have some cool project and ask people that they know to pro present. I think it is really good that one chapter says that another chapter did a cooler project than the one we did. So most of those that got into my presentations are one chapter promoting another. Uh, that, 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 that gave a high cool factor. So let's dig in, let's see the time. Cool projects in 2004. QR code wiki time. This is something to show that this presentation, not mine, concept, the concept of Wikimania, is actually changing the world for the better. Three years ago, Ludovic has presented this talk, and at the end, we choose, you guys, choose the coolest, the coolest project by the Wikimedia movement for that year, for the year in question. And three years ago, it was the city in Wales, one more? One more in Wales, the first QR city in the world with signs showing QR codes that you can read articles about places. And that was the coolest project of that year. And it got everybody enthusiastic afterwards. You had newspaper articles about it throughout the world. And suddenly, mayors in many, many countries, more than the countries that their chapters wanted to do that in their town. And it's not just putting signs, it's quite a serious work to write the articles, which usually don't exist, about the city, to find the materials. And this shows that what we choose here actually has a positive effect somewhere around the world. Three QR projects, well, this is not working. It is, it is. Just, it is. Oh, just, yeah, okay. The first QR city outside uh, Europe um, was, um, this is the park. Fremantle in Western Australia, the first one outside Europe. Um, it started as a, as a content 
expansion project, starting with writing articles. You can't put a QR code if you don't actually have an article that the QR code would go to. And that's the really difficult part, convincing the city to give you information, convincing people to help you with this. And it ended up as a QR city. I asked each chapter to give us some tips, because the purpose is not to just promote that city in Western Australia, but um, which is obviously cool, because now it's a little town, but also to give you a tip how to do it. And what we already know, partners are the most important part. You need to have the city or people working on it. This is true for any project. You need to have the partners committed. If the other party does not want to commit, don't start a project. It's true to any project. And you need a local community to work with the partners. You cannot have just the partners and not community support. Who are all the other people that are there? Sorry? Let, let's do a question at the end because I have lots of projects to, to run for. Um, we have a guy from Australia who perhaps can answer the questions at the end. Um, another pure town, again in Western Australia. Okay, you know how to say this. No, I don't. To the A, that's the name of the city? To J. The name of the city, a second city in, uh, in Western Australia. Um, this one included uh, also QR codes in museums. This I'm not really going to this. Mm -hmm. Again, the main tip is to have good partners and to allow them to lead the projects. You need to help them feel that they are doing something great. This will help you in participate in further projects, and it's one of the major parts of doing any Wikipedia projects with a partner. You will need them to do more always, and they can always help you with things you didn't know and things you didn't think about. Think of each project just as a stepping stone for the next project. And this is, I think, the most of the lessons learned. I got the, I got the, while I was working during the conference, I got more and more projects entering in, so not all the slides are as pretty because some were made today during lunch. Um, but the next pure project is in the Sofia Zoo in uh, Bulgaria. Um, this project is quite unique. It's actually one person who decided to do something and went and did it. Not, no chapter behind her, very low funding. And it's also unique because it got the people at the zoo to read the chapter in the Bulgarian Wikipedia, edit the, uh, the articles in the Bulgarian, Bulgarian Wikipedia, adding them and make sure they are quality enough to be presented to the people who visited the zoo. So this project actually improved the Wikipedia in a great way, not just promotional thing, you have a nice QR code that leads to Wikipedia, the nice glam world, the nice uh, cooperation between the community and the play, but it also made the encyclopedia much better. It's such a cool project, I'm going to time this myself, I hope this year. Um, Okay, that's about QR codes. Uh, next thing I'm going to talk about is conferences. Is okay? First conference, Wiki Conference USA. Um, what's unique about this conference, it was the first one in the United States, first national conference. You would expect the foundation to have done something in the past 10 years, but they didn't. Um, it took the collaboration of two chapters to do this conference, the DC chapter and the New York chapter. It was actually quite a big conference, three days, 300 attendees at New York. The next one, I find it an extra cool project, though it's quite dangerous. Uh, food and drink in Austria. What I understand is, from this project, that people in Austria and people in Germany argue a lot about the procedures in preparation of certain types of traditional foods. And this led to a lot of clashes and edit wars in the German Wikipedia. <laughs> to solve that, Wikimedia Austria has decided to hold a conference, which included three days wine tasting, visits to bakeries and confectionaries. <laughs> uh, mostly, they cooked everything they argued about, took excellent pictures, I've seen the pictures in the comments, the amazing pictures and videos of how to prepare the food. This is creating a much more friendlier community with less arguing. And hundreds of photos of commons, wiki TVs and lots of food, which is a great way to have a conference. This, this is just, this is a good project. Uh, the main tip, please note it, it's really important, Bring containers for the leftovers. 
The Guru Shiva project done by Danny here. Danny, hands up. Uh, uh, they had 20 workshops with 10 classes. Lots of Wikipedia can participate and wrote many articles about the city, hoping to turn it in, into a QR city eventually when they have enough articles. Um, the articles are uh, checked by Wikipedians and some of them got really good. We are talking about ninth grader usually, which usually do not have the skills to write Wikipedia articles. So that's why this amount of article is it's nice. Their tips is important support from the local community. People should have patience not to read the articles done by the students and come to help with the uh, workshops and committed partners. Another one from Israel. Those of you who have been this room this morning have seen this, this is the week he met. This is the first course about Wikipedia University in the world. I know that there are many courses, over I think more than 100, 200, I don't know how many, where people in university write articles as an assignment for their course. Write a Wikipedia article as an assignment. This is done worldwide in many universities. But usually it is one course, for example, if I, I teach in a law school, I teach insurance law, the students can write articles about insurance. Uh, I assist in another law, law class, the student may write articles about whatever they study in that class. This course was to study how to edit Wikipedia. A 14 weekly sessions, two hours each, in which they study how to edit. Their assignment eventually was to write an article in medicine. But it's not a course about a subject. The whole course was about how to learn how to edit. We should go to the next slide. Um, the, the eventually, there were about 60 students. The interesting is the, about, thing about it is 50% women, which is very high percentage. Usually in workshops, we have much lower percentage, only 20% women. For the world, even less, so it's a very high percentage. Half of them were also Arabic. Arabs who later wrote the articles also in Arabic. And what's also important that all the students enjoyed this so much that they volunteered to help next year with tutoring the students who will do this again. And that the faculty also liked this so much that they wanted to turn this into a regular course in the faculty. And this can be done worldwide because we have a syllabus. If you want to ask about it and you missed the session this morning, Shani did this. This is Shani's project, Shani. have a smaller class because it's very difficult to help all the students when it's needed and have more workshops. We had, for example, a whole lesson about copyright law, a whole lesson about references, a whole lesson about how to put pictures and images in Wikipedia, make these children, make, give them more time to practice. Um, another education program, program was done in Hong Kong, uh, the City University of Hong Kong, and right here. Yeah did an editathon about women and art in Wikipedia. We don't have enough articles about women, we don't have enough articles about art, but obviously we don't have an article about both of them. And they specified the work on articles about female artists in Hong Kong. Again, a very nice way to fill up something that's missing and can be done with women artists anywhere throughout the world. A bit about lobbying. Several projects were suggested. I just chose one, but I could have chosen the other. This is Open Government Wiki Hack in Washington, D.C. Next slide. This is confusing me. Yeah, okay. Um, in April, 30 participants in the brainstorming and wiki hacking about how to use open data from the U.S. government for various projects. Um, I also had projects of open lobbying, uh, of lobbying and open government in Europe, but I just chose this one. They are all cool the same way, so I don't want to insult on any of the European projects uh, as well. Um, another thing that we need to discuss is, of course, GLAM, one of the, I would say, sexier aspects of Wikipedia work, work with galleries, libraries, uh, archives, and museums. I chose one project. From several, well, actually, I chose two projects from several suggested because they are unique. The Numismatica Piego uh, Foundation released images of coins to the public domain. What's unique is that this is a private institution, not a public institution. Glams are usually very zealous, very jealous, and very holding everything close to the chest. They want their images to themselves and to convince any glam institution to give up 
information to the public domain is very, very difficult, and a private one is nearly impossible. And here they succeeded in uploading uh, about 250 images to the commons, and a third of these are using in many articles, what many languages, very little coins. And this is something, this, this is a project, a special lesson should be learned. I think the most important one is start small, have a pilot, show the people that the images are used in many Wikipedias, and it's easy to do, to convince them to give four images and then you go and plant them over 60, 70 Wikipedias, you can do it yourself. If it's a good image, it will be used, it will enhance many Wikipedias, and then you go back and show them how great it was. And they, they are convinced that they are doing something good. Um, and actually, I, I usually thought that these kind of blogs are impossible and this could be wrong, so very cool. I don't know who is the person who did this in this room, but it is a clapping. Cultural saving of these weird things. Uh, this is a project from the Ukraine, the Kolesa recording. In the early 20th century, there were many folk artists. And I'm talking about, sort of, think about the uh, bards, uh, the old style European people who went with lutes and lyres and played. The world People like this in the Ukraine in the beginning of the 20th century, this all stopped after the communists got control of that country. And luckily, they were recorded in the, this year, between 1904 and 1910, and the recording were forgotten somewhere, deteriorating, and this project was to digitalize them. They were never published before, and if this was not done, they would have never been published because the recording would have been destroyed. This is something that cannot be reproduced no other way, and the Wikimedia, Foundation, the, the, the local people who did this, the Wikimedia Ukraine, the chapter, actually saved something for the World Heritage and for future generation, which makes this very cool, and especially now it's public domain, it's by say, on commons. Um, okay, so that was the list of projects that I chose uh, from the various submissions. I want to do something we didn't do before, is discuss a little bit what is cool. This is just to give you an idea. I asked various people of uh, various chapters what they think to be cool. This is the answers I got. Uh, Australia, Gideon Digby said, a project that extends beyond the wiki community, um, brings more contributors, thus enhancing the community, and doing something beyond the limitation of the internet, saving something for future generations. I'm adding my own words here. I'm not sure romantic, but part of it um, the important thing is the second bit. You cannot sh share the sum of all human knowledge if you don't go and get it for you first. If it's not in your hand, you cannot share it. So that's part of what's been cool. James Hare from Washington is here. So, okay. Any project that we do that's unique, exciting, and has high potential of impact, and I think all the projects that I've shown you have answered this criteria. Claudia from Austria was very helpful in making this presentation. Uh, project that created enthusiasm among our volunteers. This is important. Volunteers who are not enthusiasts don't stay. And creates momentum, uh, creates passion, also people outside the community, because then they bring in the knowledge that we can share. And last one from Spain, Santiago Sanz. I think I like this definition the most, if I put it last. A cool project would be a new project with, that would make, uh, or oh, an old one with change that would, would make it uh, new and attractive. This is the important part. It should be easy to do in other countries. If we do something locally and small, that's nice. We could even save something that would have been lost forever. But if other people cannot do it throughout the world, we need something too small. We need to save bigger stuff. So the last definition is important. You don't have to agree with me. I bought in four people who should disagree with me, or uh, not necessarily, I want to invite some panel members. Here with Michal Lester, the Executive Director of Kibiki Israel, Asaf Porto, and the Chief of Our Nation. What I asked the panel members in advance, 
was to answer okay, I need to go now. I'm going to give you the question because you can't see the screen. I answered these questions in advance, so they be ready. They don't have to answer all of them, Asaf has to answer two of them. Um, and at, so we can discuss this. Yeah, right, it's good. But before that, before we go into the panel and the discussion, I want us to choose this year, the 2014, coolest project of the Wikimedia movement. And in order to do that, we did some pre-selection. We chose four projects for you to choose from. Uh, I think we will do it by clapping or shouting or by keeping it at time. Clap, just clapping, no shouting. Clapping. What do you think is the coolest project? And our four uh, students at Panamata will help you choose the coolest one. Um, nothing biased, but food and drink, Vienna. If you think this is cool, clap now.
So other thing, uh, way of talking about impact is that we have more volunteers. So if a chapter can help volunteers to do funding and impact projects, so other volunteers will come. So we have to think also about how this cool project will really put more volunteers and do more things. So I think that's another way of looking at cool project that will help us to bring more people to our communities. So cool project is a stepping stone to other projects. Yes, and we need more volunteers that then continue to be with us. Okay. Um, in the way I, I, I put the, the statement before of people from the world, the way I saw cool project is a project that moved from one chapter to another, it can be propagated throughout the movement. What, what do you think? That's question number two. Can one local project be moved to another, or is it a cultural thing that can move only in localized area, or is there any, can there be any problems in moving a cool project from one place to another? Let's start again with what we can um, I think it depends very much on the project. Sometimes you have something really, really cool, but it only works in one country because there is a specific set of requirements because you need uh, certain conditions in a certain language, a government that collaborates, partners, and sometimes it's uh, it's really good, well scalable. And if it's scalable, if it's if it's possible to do it in another country, another region, another time period, then uh, that might actually help very much. But then again, I think the fun factor is the most important factor in determining whether you can scale something to another region, another group. Um, I want to add that, uh, of course, Lodewijk himself has proven this with Wikilab's monuments, which started in the Netherlands, expanded to Europe, expanded to the world. But the key is not that, yes, other countries also have monuments, so obviously, technically, yes, you could go and take well, we don't know how. Um, but uh, theoretically, yes, you could do this anywhere in the world. But the key to the successful scalability of Wikilab's monuments or expansion uh, to the rest of the world was very hard work that Lodewijk and his colleagues at the Wikilab's monuments team have done to help expand it. They have deliberately helped other groups adopt their model. They have prepared materials. They have shared their strategy on how they did the social media around this. Uh, in, in, I think it was last year, there was an actual kit and the timeline for what you need to have prepared by month six and by month seven. And that was a tremendous example of how uh, a group that has achieved success, has figured it out locally, can help other groups figure it out in their context. And of course, they don't have all the answers. They're just, they're just bringing their experience, and with other local groups, they can work to adapt it to their other circumstances. But I think we can all learn from that experience. And I encourage those of you who don't know it or haven't seen the kit to take a look at it, even if you don't care particularly about looking at those monuments, to take a look at how you describe a program for other people to replicate. And I'd like to add that um, basically, yes, a project can, um, can uh, uh, move to another um, to other uh, communities, but um, one has to reflect um, the differences. It's not a guarantee when a project has run in one community, there's no guarantee that it will work any different without making modifications or adopting as you make it already. Yeah. It's very important to get some guarantee to actually modify it, adopting to your very own culture and to do the very own community. Um, let's think about the Ukrainian music, music. Maybe we can do together. We can take the idea. We can look in our countries for such materials. We can take the inspiration from that, and that's other thing that we can make that move on in the community. And um, my next questions are. Uh, I'm going to join two questions together, uh, mostly for Dennis and, uh, and Han um, about. And it's related something to what, something that Asaf said. When we're thinking about cool project, we want to propagate it, we need to make materials, we need to have documentation ready for other texture to it. This is something usually that local volunteers have difficulty doing because they want to do the fun stuff, not do all the detailed reporting, the long list, the blogs. That's the more difficult part from my experience. So this relates to how can the local chapter assist in running a cool project? And also I'm mixing with the next question. Should it come from the local chapter? Should the community are going to know the and say, okay, this is the weekend, this is now the coolest picture of the uh, coolest project this year, let's do something like that? Or should it be the volunteers always who come to the chapter and say, this is what we want to do, you help us? 
I think I'll try to, to tackle them to the last question. If, if a project is really, really cool, then the volunteers can contribute. And the volunteers come up with the best ideas so far. I mean, if it's, uh, if it's a really cool project, most of the times it has been a single volunteer that came up with the idea. It needs some adaption, it needs a lot of help. But in the end, the chapters are not there to order to boss around volunteers. And the foundation isn't either, of course, but it's there to facilitate volunteers and to make them be most effective. So uh, for a project to be most effective, usually that is the best route. It doesn't always work that way, but in a perfect world, it would. I will just add that um, I agree that the, the, the ideas come from volunteers. Uh, organizations also need strategies, they need a plan, but that plan doesn't have to include every single project that will happen in this country or in this region. The plan needs to include things like what kinds of activities will we be supporting, what is the budget that we allocate to these kinds of activities, and allow a lot of room for that innovation to come in. The key thing, and that applies to the foundation just as much as the chapters, is to make sure that your volunteers, your volunteer base, are aware of the support that you are able and interested in offering them. For example, I will now make sure that everyone in this room is aware that I am giving out grants. And you don't have to be a chapter to ask for a grant. So now you all know, if you have an idea, if you are inspired by something, one thing you already know you can do is ask for a grant. Come talk to me or my colleagues at the grant booth. Uh, this, this very act that I just did is a form of informing the volunteers that this exists and when the inspiration strikes, when they have an idea, they should come to us, to their local chapter, to the foundation, to other experienced people around them and, and share that idea, share the opportunity that has, that has come their way and get the support that they need. Um, I'd like to talk from the first topic's questions and especially um, I guess it's um, yes, grant making is, um, is a very, very basic uh, way of supporting volunteers when they are running their ideas and they intend to, to run a project. Um, but um, there, are, there are further steps and um, there is some um, basic organizational um, support and just uh, to drop a few, um, there are accreditations for photographers, for example, um, which can be easily done. Um, and. Um, there is, or a contractor, if um, um, formal organizations needed to act as, an, um, as a contractor, that's easy to be done for a um, for chapter, for a local chapter. But there's um, something more you can, as we usually act in the same community, in the same national community, we can um, support the development of the community, especially um, when running projects, that there is um, that to provide people with uh, possibilities to run this sustainable, to make documentation that other people in the same community can reproduce their ideas easily and, um, and to, to assist um, by taking off risks of the volunteers. There are many risks around when you run a project and it's um, so pretty easy to take these um, from the volunteers so that they can um, do their project easily and um, that they can be safe when they do projects. From, as a perspective that we can approach them and ask if they, if we have an idea as a chapter, that how we can support them and help them. That, that's something that important for us to do so that, let's, for example, we started to uh, ask our volunteers if it's back that we will translate English stuff because it's hard for them. So <coughs> some of us can really support the volunteers that have these cool ideas and they need help that to be developed all over the world. So that's other thing that we can do. Not only to wait, they will come to us, but to go to them and ask them what we think that might help them and to have this open dialogue with together and find ways to help each other. Because it's also helping the chapter that this we have, have connection with volunteers and it's going connection. So I think that it's it's good for both of the sides, both sides. The, the last, I have a question related to something with Hauser, which is not exactly the, the question that's Supposed to one between you now. If if the chapter is opposing a project and the volunteers are enthusiastic about it, can it still be done, or do you think this clash would cause make the project not work? If the volunteers want to do a project and the chapter is against it. Okay. 
I guess that depends on the reason. I mean, if, if, if a chapter has good reason to oppose something, then maybe other volunteers would agree with that. Um, if, uh, because sometimes chapters actually have good reasons to say, well, this might not be the best thing in the world because copyright or because of legal problems or because there's simply no money. And it's hard to argue against something like that. Um, but I do think, in a general sense, that it's good that um, Wikimedia organizations have a certain flexibility so that they shouldn't oppose something simply because it doesn't exactly fit in the plan that they had uh, nine months before the year started, but that uh, they give some opportunity and some flexibility to volunteers. But that's not always possible, unfortunately. I'll, I'll just say briefly, uh, a chapter is in control of a chapter's resources. If you don't depend on the chapter's resources, then of course the chapter can't stop you, shouldn't stop you. You can do whatever you want, be bold, etc. If you do need chapter resources and the chapter board or, or, or uh, even AGM does not agree with you, my advice to you, if you still think it's a good idea, and I do invite you to pause a moment and think maybe I'll be right, but if you do still think it's a good idea, my advice to you, what I would do in your shoes is, I would think of a smaller version of the same idea, a pilot program, a proof of concept that I can do on a shoestring or for free or, or without that resource that I need, and do that and come back with results. Maybe change their minds. Yeah. Well, I think that it's better that we oppose as a chapter never that against volunteers, but um, we say we will not support. That's uh, rarely the case that we can get um, doesn't support as we try to help them that they get it more developed in case that we have uh, um, some, some, if we believe that it could be better, it could be made better, we try to, to support the, um, the um, volunteer and that them. We will never try to stop someone to do something. It's not uh, that's not our, our work to, to do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 You don't have to answer any questions now. Of course, never to stop. But I think that in the board, in the chapters are working, and that should be a conversation between volunteers. Volunteer that suggested the project and the board, and that's the way that it should be. Handed because volunteers talk about it at the same level, I think that's the best way to start in this process of thinking about why to cause and not to cause. That's only to be done by the volunteers with the volunteers. Because if there is a staff, the staff shouldn't be involved. Not the professional staff, the board was the volunteer. Mm -hmm. But if it wanted to answer? Maybe, maybe I can reverse the question. Um, because I think this is actually quite a rare situation, relatively speaking. Um, so, so there are a lot of volunteers here in the room, right? I mean, are there who volunteers? considers themselves volunteer? As in, who could join such a project and help organizing something? So then it's the question for, for me to you is basically, what do you prefer? Because this is something everybody give, it differs in an opinion. Do you prefer to join a project to be able to um, basically tag along in an existing infrastructure, an existing idea? Or are you one of these people that really like to organize their own project and maybe an awesome idea, but that, that is your uh, primary preference? So because these are two different types of volunteers. Who considers themselves to be a uh, volunteer that, that only want to do something that they invented themselves? Because this is, so I see like. This is the, this is the point where you, you should raise your hands. If yeah, just higher, because yeah. I do not see the hands very well. So this is like four or five people. This is the kind of people that come up with amazing ideas, but sometimes they disagree with big group because it's something new. And now who would like, who is more the type of volunteer that joins an existing program? Can I see some hands? <coughs> so this is actually a much bigger group, and I think this is something to keep in mind when you, when you think about, about hey, um, because most of the volunteers will be happy to join a good project and maybe not necessarily need to lead it. Dennis? So I, um, so I, um, I have experience that there are people who, had a, who have been persons who worked in projects of other people um, in, in the first moment 
and they got encouraged enough to say, hey, I want to make my own project now, and then this is just learning and making and uh, seeing how it gets. And this is um, to get more experience. Okay, um, I know I'm supposed to be asking the question, not answering them, but still it's my presentation. So, th these are not questions out of the blue. Uh, I'm skipping the last question because I stopped answering the word twice, and I think, actually, I think you can answer it the third time. Can the dimension assist in a project, whether or not the local chapter? The answer is yes. I'm not. You want to answer? Please answer. Spoiler. Spoiler. <laughs> yes, the answer is yes, of course. Uh, just to add to what I already said, beyond grants which the foundation gives uh, to individuals and groups, whether recognized user groups or not, and to chapters, beyond grants, the foundation has some other resources that I think um, we need to do a better job of, of letting the community know uh, about. Because we are trying to collect learnings from other people's programs, from chapter programs, from, from programs all, all over. And, and bake them into uh, toolkits, into resources, and we put them on Meta, and very soon we will start translating those toolkits as well to make them available in other languages. So we do, while we can't really support, uh, uh, I don't know, thousands of volunteers each in their own project across the world, we can support and do support hundreds via grants, and we can support more passively support many more through those resources, those toolkits, that we make available. Uh, once again, I encourage you to um, create your own connection with the foundation and the resources that it produces uh, to help your project. Uh, just, okay, thanks. And you can do a local project without asking anybody to support you. Uh, so it's very, very simple. The most uh, effective and, uh, and great projects have started very, very small and hopefully, as you said, I mean, as a small pilot as, a, yeah, as an idea within the media and then it's been scaled up one day. Maybe then we'll start on a, uh, on a um, These questions are not out of the blue. Uh, I, I chose them in advance without seeing the projects. I chose them when I submitted this uh, presentation to, to Ufnania. But eventually they, they turned to be very uh, uh, telling. Uh, several of the projects presented here today were done against the local chapter's wishes, and sometimes the local chapter even tried to stop them. A big number of the coolest projects, the last one that you voted, on were not done with what well, happened actually. Were not done with the chapter's assistant. So we have two, three, three local projects with the help, two of them I think with the help of the foundation. So the ch it's not the chapter or the availability of funds by the chapter or the assistant that makes a cool project. What we are saying here, this is actually the purpose of Wikimania. These are the coolest ideas we have done this year. If you have cooler ideas, please submit them next year, so all can learn. And you don't need a chapter, you don't really need a foundation. The only thing that's really important is the enthusiasm of the volunteers and the good ideas. If you have these two, you can do whatever you want. Um, you want just a final word, or you don't have to? No? And you can open it to questions. We have short time, nine minutes for questions. Okay, now let's start. Uh, hi, I like just to one. Yeah, I ask if you can, if you have a question for the whole panel or just a specific person, please. And introduce yourself. Uh, and introduce yourself. Okay, uh, I'm Liang from Wikimedia Taiwan, and I like to know how you keep like positive thinking toward failed project, uh, because uh, we're not only facing the user retention problem. I think we're also facing the project manager retention problem. They may get face uh, criticism from other community members. So how do how can we deal with the, with this kind of move? I anyone who want to respond. Uh, I want to respond first if I can. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the way I see it, there is no such thing as a failed project because whatever we try and do is usually the first time in the world that something like this has been tried and done. Most of the cool projects is something nobody has ever tried before, nobody has ever thought it would succeed. So even if it failed, we need to see what we did wrong and try to learn from it. Other chapters may still learn from the mistakes and not to do stuff, 
and maybe we can try it again another way and succeed the next time. But even if we fail and something doomed for failure, a project completely out of the blue, still, that's something nobody has ever tried before, and that should be respected. Yes? Um, <coughs> yes, failure is a normal part of life. Failure <laughs> is a normal part of doing things. If you do things, you will occasionally fail. Ideally, you will succeed more than you fail. Ideally, you will learn when you fail. I can speak for the foundation and say that we treat failure as a learning opportunity. We treat it as something that is normal in much that we do, not just things that we fund. We ourselves very often fail. Sometimes we even learn from failure, not as often as I would have liked. Um, and so um, you will not see us, for example, uh, responding to a failed project uh, um, as uh, uh, with, with, with a punitive attitude, right? We will not uh, complain that your project failed. We will ask you questions. What, what do you think could be done better? How, what, how would you measure this differently? Maybe the goals were too ambitious, that kind of thing. We, we immediately turn it into a learning opportunity. And of course, we may not fund such a project in the future. That may be one conclusion of a failed project, or we may just try it differently. But you will not see a negative um, attitude from the foundation. I think you were also asking about how to face other people in the community who will be complaining about the project failure. And um, well, um, some people will be negative. Uh, it's, it's the job of people who, who agree with me that, that failing is part of doing to send that message, to say, yes, this didn't quite work out the way we planned. Uh, I think I know why. Here, here are some conclusions I've drawn, and I will try it differently the next time, or I will you know, do a different project next time. I intend to improve and continue doing things. How about you? You know, uh, be that attitude that you would like to see. And chapters are very often are, um, in a close re um, personal relationship and um, relationship to um, people who make projects and when they fail it's important to, to be supportive encouraging and to say, hey, that's not the, the end of the world. This project has failed, but um, get a new one, ask yourself why, and um, learn from the failures you have this time, but ask yourself, um, what's a better way to run a project? Is a smaller project that maybe um, good for you or help when, um, what to be helpful in the very moment when it can be seen that a project will fail. So failure is not a final state, but you can see it in, a, in, a, in the moment before, and so you can, um, when you ask for the personal effect, for the frustration which, um, which failure generates, so you can, um, so you can um, help a person that um, in, a, in a moment before that failure, and that the project will, will run smoothly to, 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 to its end, and then you can um, analyze it and say, okay, it would have been a failure if we both would not have been. Um, and multi that project, so that the failure is not too drastic. Okay, uh, another question, yes? Hi, uh, Sabrina Leachie from Media Ireland. I'd love to hear the panel's view on funding for project management of the projects, um, uh, as opposed to logic, as well as funding the resources needed to bring the project to life. Uh, project management, by which you mean compensation for people's time, for the time they put into running a project, uh, as distinct from being a volunteer project manager, which is kind of the, the default um, we take from the wiki, where we expect the work to be voluntary. Um, the answer is, we do fund that um, when we see compelling, um, uh, a compelling case for how, A, uh, there isn't enough energy or resources or the environment is such where the project cannot go on without uh, compensating the person who will be putting in the bulk of the work. And there, there are, there are we live in different circumstances around the world. Some people don't have, uh, I don't know, the flexible vacation days that I enjoyed when I was doing stuff as a volunteer. Uh, working as a software engineer, I could just take a half day off and deliver a Wikipedia talk. Uh, other people may not be able to do that. And so I'm fully cognizant of that. Um, the other issue is whether the paid project manager or the paid uh, coordinator role 
enables a lot of additional volunteer labor. That is a very big consideration in whether we want to pay for a certain role or not. We, we would like to see paid roles be multipliers, be, be leveraged to reach a lot more work to enable a lot of the volunteer work. So if, if we're talking about a project where there's very little energy in the community, there's very little support for it, there's one person who is really dedicated and wants to do it, but that person will need to devote weeks of their lives, can't afford to do it, can't afford to take enough vacation, etc., and so is seeking compensation to just do it on their own, that's a more difficult um, uh, scenario to fund. However, we actually have an individual engagement grants program at the foundation, which is designed to largely compensate people for their time on individual projects. As distinct from the this type of project that we've seen here, the type of project that my program funds, which is generally expected to be group setting and involve large parts of the community. Does that answer your question? Thank you. I think uh, another aspect that uh, I had a conversation with Michal and also with the people in the foundation, the foundation expects uh, volunteers to share their knowledge throughout the world, write blogs, write uh, lots of documentation. And this is something very difficult for volunteers to do, especially very difficult to do it in English. It is highly, nearly impossible to find information about projects throughout the movement in English. I've been looked at all these projects, I can tell you. Most of them, what was done through the Google Translate, not bad, not good. Uh, I think that the foundation should acknowledge this is a need that the, fund, that the volunteers cannot handle and the chapters, and I know Kimi Israel is doing this, set funds for translations. Telling the volunteers, you do the work, you write it in the, your own language, and we will make sure it propagates by the movements by translating it and putting it in the right things. I think the foundation should also understand that, and that, that will actually help the movement. Uh, we already do this. We accept grant applications in other languages and we encourage people who have had projects to blog about them in their own language. If they can also help us and offer an English version to run simultaneously on the blog, that's fantastic. If they cannot, we will get it translated and run, and run it on the Wikimedia blog. So, you know, in a, to a large extent, we're already encouraging people to do this. We are committed to the multilingual nature of our community and our <coughs> movement. It's right there in our vision uh, statement. If we want every human being to share in the sum of all knowledge, that does imply it cannot be done in English only. And so um, if you run into a language barrier, I'll, I'll pick you up on this. If you run into a language barrier in your work, if you feel you could do this, if only you didn't have to, I don't know, get this text translated into English, get in touch with us. We can help. Okay, I think we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank one person I didn't thank earlier, uh, Roman Salas from Italy, for helping me with this. Again, I want to thank my four panel members, please. Because it was funded by a Wikimedia Foundation grant, you can read a complete description of this project in English on Meta. And in a few weeks, when Susanna is done, you will also be uh, you will also be ready to be able to read the report about this grant, about this project, which will also be in English. But of course, you should talk to Susanna herself. By the end of the week, the whole uh, presentation will be on Commons for you to use to show it now. Thank you. Thank you, Gabor.
要准备礼物。然后就另外一边的是。
Hello again. Um, so uh, for the next couple of minutes, we would like to talk about what and how users read. And actually, we would like to present some ideas we have on how you can transform reading preferences and reading behavior into valuable feedback for the Wikipedia community. And yes, we would like to start this talk um, with a question or with a statement. And I assume that almost everybody here is an editor in Wikipedia. Um, so is this correct? Can you please raise your hand if you are an editor in Wikipedia? Not everybody, but almost everybody. So I have to tell you something. We know you. <laughs> so in the last 10 years, uh, researchers has done a lot of research about you and in various areas. So just to give you an impression. So there has been um, a huge literature review, including almost 500 research papers, highly cited research papers on Wikipedia. And almost 40% of these papers were somehow related to you, what you do, your work, your activities, almost everything. Only a very, very small percent percentage were related to the other side, to the usage, usage side of Wikipedia, the readers, only 1.4%. So actually, oh, I can introduce you. I'm Claudia, that's Jeanette, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and so we both were wondering. Um, <laughs> we both were wondering. And, um, uh, so, uh, about it, and um, it's the, the point um, behind it is that how researchers look at readers, and you probably look at readers as well. So they are actually second class members of an online community. They are not important for you, dog. <laughs> they are lurkers and free riders. They are more resource taking than adding any value to the community, and. But there, be, there might be valuable sometimes if they become uh, contributors. So this is how researchers define readers yeah. in online communities. Um, actually, we want to make a different point here. We think um, um, readers are useful for you. And I think you should think a little bit more about them and how they read and what they read. So um, in order to underline the statement, um, we came from different perspectives and here you can read some of them. So actually, if uh, as an author on Wikipedia, I feel that my work is more valuable than an increasing number of readers access my articles after I work on them. Or as an editor uh, who is responsible for quality assurance, I can use reading time, for example, as an additional measure. So including the usage, the usage side in my, uh, in my estimations or in my um, yeah, determination of article quality. As an interface designer, it might be interesting for me um, to adapt uh, a certain article uh, representation by consider considering um, yeah, certain reading patterns. There might be many, many more different perspectives to think about readers and why they might be useful for you. Um, but I think finally, as a user, so as a reader, um, I have a better reading experience if you think of, of me as a reader. And I think I'm, I'm more likely to return. And eventually, it's more likely, it's my segment, this is, that I become a contributor. So, um, we actually made the first step here. We thought about readers. And in the first part of this study I present here, we thought about reading preferences. So what actually readers read on Wikipedia? <laughs> so as a very first approach, we took the 500 most popular articles in Wikipedia using the, using the page view data, and then we annotated them manually using the categories you see here. In which Wikipedia page? In, in, in English Wikipedia, very important. Yeah. Good point. And uh, what you observe here that really the, the high, the, the, most of the people read about biography 
articles. So about musician, politician, historical figures, it's all over 40%. And there are less articles uh, about sports and health and so on. Which is also quite interesting because we know that uh, biography articles uh, create also a large amount of articles in the Wikipedia. So also editors are interested in them. So when we saw this data, we were wondering if article and article's popularity actually changed over time. So we made some um, investigations on, on, on this. OK, and uh, I can answer the question with yes. So indeed, there are changes over time. So we get, this time we took a one year of data, and we looked at the popularity per month. And we observed, uh, let's say, three main patterns. One, that the popularity is not changing. So like uh, in the case of Albert Einstein, uh, people come regularly to read about the article. But then you have other articles uh, where you really observe a bursty popularity behavior. So people access uh, this article really, really often, or maybe just one day or one month. Mm, which could be, the reason would be because it's a certain day, such as Valentine's Day, or it could be a movie release, and so on and so on. And the last pattern is quite interesting because here we have a really slow increase or decrease of popularity, which might be if an event, such as this bit one direction, becomes more and more popular, also more people start to access the article. And as you see here, the increase. It could be, of course, that also that is what important popularity remains constant or decrease again. So, when, if you're interested in, in specific articles and you want to know if you can find the same pattern or in, in your articles, actually the data are available. Um, so, um, I think everybody knows uh, this site here. It shows you the uh, uh, yeah. Statistics on Wikipedia, on Wikipedia article. Every Wikipedia article in Wikipedia has the statistics available, and you also have the page view data. So the only problem here is that you only get the page view data for 60 days. 60 days page view data are good, but it doesn't help you to to explore any trend or to see any trend in the data if you see if it's if there's a peak or so. So it would be nice if. Uh, the extension of the future of this data. Another problem is, um, do you know what it means to have a page, page view count of 12,000 12, a day? Is it a high, a high page view count? Is it a low one? So you definitely need some comparisons here. So in order to get a better understanding what it means if this uh, article is highly requested. So um, yeah, again, it would be nice if um, this data could be available here as well. Okay, uh, when we saw the data and uh, we proceeded discussing the data, and then we were only wondering, hmm, so how is actually reading interest or reading behavior uh, or reading, reading preferences of, of people related to you editing preferences? Is there a relation? So you edit, you edit more and more people read it. And this is the next question we ask in our research. So what we did to answer this question, we took a very simple approach to just check whether we observe something. And so we created a preference matrix. And in the preference matrix, we compared reading and um, editing preferences. And reading preferences were measured by the popularity, and editing preferences uh, were measured by the article length. Where we just, we just assumed that uh, so the short articles are really sometimes just a couple of lines long, where we we can just make the assumption that okay, not many editors were interested so far in editing these articles. And the first two places that we observed uh, is where we really find an alignment between the preferences of uh, editors and authors. So there are articles that are really popular but also highly edited, and articles that are very unpopular and have also no name. Then we have articles that uh, are very well established, with a high quality, but the popularity is low. So users don't visit them. And if you think back about that uh, popularity can change over time, what you see here, that these are articles that were popular at a certain point in time and now not anymore. And what is the opposite you observe in this group? 
because here you have articles that are not popular or very very also popular over a certain amount of time, but uh, the quality or the information available is really low. So it might be interesting to know whether improving these articles would also improve the reading engagement of the users. So, so again, this is a very scientific perspective to look at this, but um, well, you might be interested in having uh, these data or this information available um, as well. So we actually looked um, at Wikipedia and checked if this data is available, and I can tell you yes, actually. <laughs> I don't know if you know this past accommodation uh, service in um, English here uh, that suggests sport. It provides you with task recommendations, like what would you like to um, edit next. And uh, part of this task recommendations is, is a table, uh, which we highlighted here. And the first two columns um, of uh, these tables provide the data. Um, so first of all, the reader's interest data in, in is used per day, and the quality data, so you, yeah, editing preference data is quality, um, they have a quite good model behind it. And um, again, the data are available, but how can you work with the data if they're presented in, in that way? So we recommend to rearrange the data in a way we present it to you that you have these groups and the clusters, and you can actually work with uh, articles you would like to work with, you know, if you're interested in, in, in somehow uh, considering uh, readers or readers' interest in, in, your, in your activities. Okay, this was the first part and the second part of, of our study. And this is something, uh, I think preferences is, is not new to you, so because it's, it's page data used here. But the second um, part of the study um, cared about reading behavior. So how actually user, users read Wikipedia or Wikipedia articles? And for this we had to think completely different about readers and what they do, and we had to define reading sessions. Okay, so what does it mean? We were really lucky because we were uh, allowed, or users gave, the, gave us the permission to track their browsing behavior over one year in time. And we were able to look what they're doing on Wikipedia. And uh, based on the stream of data we were using, we identified reading sessions. So we identified when the user starts going to Wikipedia until he's leaving the session. And then we looked for each article, uh, how he read this article, how he read. So this is one example, it's Albert Einstein, to that part. And here we see, okay, the article was successfully three times, which gives us a first metric to characterize the browsing be uh, reading behavior. And we also see that uh, uh, the article was, uh, the reading time was uh, over four minutes, 4.3 minutes, which gives us a second uh, metric. And as a third metric, we took uh, the number of sessions, totally the number of articles accessed within the session. Because as you can see here as well, yeah. Uh, uh, this is better for all readers, but uh, what content does it have of the uh, gender? Uh, what do you know about this reader? Um, so so um, we, we actually don't know any demographics of the readers, but uh, I can relate there is a very good study made by the Media Foundation, um, I think it's years old or so, they have some overview, some data on the gender, the age, the interests of the reader. So we look from a uh, quantitative perspective. So we don't know the people behind our data. So it's like a macro, uh, macro, pers macro perspective uh, on, 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 on the readers. So, okay. so the only thing we did, we compared our data with the page data. So what are the interests? Do they align and we observe that they align? To ensure that we do not observe something that we have only in our data. Uh, so okay, so now we have this uh, three metrics. We know how, uh, how often the user went to an article, how high is the reading time, how many other articles are accessed. So what we can do with this? Uh, we can identify reading patterns. So what we do is we group up articles that have uh, somehow similar values in the matrix and group them together. And this allows us to identify patterns. 
And in total, we identified four main reading patterns. And I'm going to represent two of them now, because I think they are the most interesting. And the nice thing is, uh, you can always identify patterns or whatever. The nice thing here is that it makes sense. <laughs> so the first one is uh, focus reading. What you see here is articles, like for instance, Albert Einstein, who uses Go to Wikipedia, go to the article, read the article in detail, maybe even the whole text, and then they read. They're not interested in related content, or <coughs> they were just interested uh, in what a really uh, good picture about this person. And the second one is exploration. And exploration was at the beginning, it was strange, because what you can see here that the user is accessing the article, that like you could see in the example before, very often within a session. And but at the same time, he's also visiting many other articles. So at the beginning, we were like, what does it mean? And when we look into the data, we realized um, the version of the, uh, an article like Ed Kuchin, the actor. The user's going to the article, and then um, <coughs> uh, reading a little bit about the biography, but then he wants to know more about the movies. So what is the reader doing? He's uh, clicking through the mob, uh, movies, using the Alpacino biography article, reading about the movies, but always returning uh, to the original article to access the next. It's like a, he's using the article like navigation with the front page. And this we found quite interesting because it means there are really different patterns. And what you can do with it, when you, uh, Claudia will explain <laughs> um, So, again, so reading behavior, we thought, or thinking about reading behavior is, is very interesting and actually you, you, you did think about readers in the past by using the article feedback tool. But well, you realized that explicit feedback given by readers is sometimes not very useful, pretty often not very useful, and you need to do a lot to, to work with comments. So um, as, you, as you know, this, uh, the article feedback tool is not available anymore. We think that um, reading behavior might be an alternative to think about um, feedback or getting feedback from readers um, in a way that readers simply read the articles and you get, um, you understand the patterns um, of how they read your articles. So for this, it is needed, um, this is very important that um, we did this analysis just for specific kinds of articles. So we have to trust the, uh, the articles that are very similar in their structure or in their topic. So we did this analysis for biography articles. And so you can extend the study for different article topics to see what kind of specific patterns, so reading patterns are available. And, and, and in this way, you, you uh, probably, uh, so we, we believe you definitely find articles that do not fit in specific patterns. And then you can, analyze if these ethic articles have specific properties or features that need to be changed in order to have whatever it means a proper reading behavior by the, by the users. Um, anyhow, another perspective to, to think about reading behavior is um, that there might be certain users out there, like me, so I go to Wikipedia to check certain um, terms and to understand what a specific term is about. Um, I read it, and um, a week later, I forgot about it most of the time, then I have to go back to the Wikipedia, check it again. And I would like, for example, to, to have a kind of annotation tool to read it here, <laughs> that can, you know, underline the most important sentences to have a better remembering of specific terms. So I think thinking about uh, reading behavior or working with reading behavior, you might find specific ways to support readers in their activities. Um, again, just ideas to keep you thinking about readers uh, may be helpful. Let's, let's wrap up. Um, there are a lot of data already available. You do know a lot about readers, especially about the preferences of readers. The only problem we saw by analyzing what kind of data what data you have available is the kind of uh, data presentation, so means data visualization. So um, we recommend to yeah find different ways to to draw 
or to, to analyze the data or to present the data. So I think then you can gain much better insights about the, read the readers of the here. Um, reading behavior is um, a concept that is not used at all in English or in Wikipedia yet, and we highly recommend to think about it. And uh, unfortunately, there's no application available yet. But uh, yeah, we hope that you're interested in, in having such an application in talk to us. <laughs> and uh, we'd like to help, help you with this. And uh, yeah, I hope then that you have an even better editing experience in the long term. The editor retention rate uh, is better as well, hopefully. Um, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I have many, many thanks to the co-authors of this research, or the co-workers of this research. This work is not being done only by Jeanette and me. It's also done by David, who's here, David, <laughs> and, and Munia and Andreas. And if you are interested in the research details of this uh, yeah, presentation, check out the paper on Jeanette's website. And if you're interested in the short review of our research, Piotr has done a, a very nice review uh, our paper on the Wikimedia Research Newsletter. I provided a link here as well. Uh, uh, thank you. So in addition to the uh, Wikimedia study on reader's profile, uh, did, did your, did your uh, study touch upon the profile? So for example, are there particular topics students are more interested in? Are there films which are ever time popular? And for example, if there is a film which has highest rating, do you engage a, a far better editor to draw more attendance, audience? So um, we don't know. So we don't know the background of, of, the, um, of the readers that attended or the data we have in this study. Um, um, it is possible so to talk to your chapters, to get the data, and to do a kind of combination of uh, quantitative and qualitative research. Then you can uh, answer those questions. But with our data, we cannot. You want to add something? No, just so the data, uh, the data, the user provided us the data, but it's uh, and so we don't know. Who because it will remain uh, uh, ineffective. If, uh, for example, you have a science uh, science article, and if, if for example, one school is uh, uh, like one thousand schools, hundred thousand schools, and for example, Titanic or Avatar or any other film, uh, usually gets ten thousand hits every day. So you make it more attractive somehow, uh, adding clips or uh, more <coughs> or juicy bits. So that are great questions you're asking, and this is what we wanted to <laughs> to, to have here, uh, because uh, we had just the data available and we saw the potential of the data, but we saw no application yet in, in Wikipedia or yeah, by the Media Foundation, and we would like to see applications here, and that's the reason why we gave this presentation to to yeah to get your interest and that we can talk about possible future. Uh, research in this area, so to, to make our research more focused on, on your needs, actually. Okay. Uh, there we go. Do you have a... Yeah, I, uh, so, first of all, you uh, and I, like, I really like the game of well, using uh, free information to prioritize the work of for the uh, right group here that we want to use uh, how people like you to discuss uh, 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 burning the issue of the same problems and services that we're doing. So um, we did a we did a um, talk on, on, on 
um, questions you just asked um, uh, uh, with uh, uh, India Germany actually a year ago. And uh, this presentation, we provide some data and some questions you have here. And um, Janet is a brain about the data. She's a data brain. She can answer. <laughs> so I try to remember. Um, I know that uh, most of the traffic is coming from search engines, also from the main page and some other minor pages, also news sites and so on. Um, I'm not sure. I think for for the metric, for the preference metrics, it was not really relevant because what we observed in this corner where you have high popularity, low lane, these were top main or uh, the main topics uh, who got popular or who have just increasing popularity now since a couple of months and users wants to know more about this person or this topic but uh, the editors are still not aware of it because I think uh, there's also research about how popularity and editing aligns and then if, uh, what we observe at least also in our data if you have a very high popularity editors are also coming and working on this article but there are some articles where you don't find it and I think it would be nice for editors if they are thinking about what to do next and they have one million articles they could work on uh, to give them a better ranking what to, what they could be interested in. So, and one thing I would like to add about the preference metrics, we have a lot of discussions about it, the preference metrics. So we, we provide article length as a measure for editing uh, preferences, but there is this nice action and model for, for determining the quality of an article that is now included in the bot. Um, and it's a chessboard. And I think the second version of the preference matrix, matrix, matrix should include um, this action model for determining the article quality. I think then you get a better picture or the picture is more precise about um, editing preferences. Good. Well, was it an answer to your questions? Some, somehow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, from your data, is it possible to see evidence of missed articles, so that a user is trying to find something and failing to do that for several attempts before finding. Mm -hmm. So what you could do is when you look at, because sometimes you have the uh, wrong documents, the links yeah. that refer to articles yeah. that does not exist, and you could shift this, so you could see if uh, they try to go to articles that are not there. Yeah. And what you can do also, which I found uh, years ago in another project, uh, that a lot of people access articles that are somehow related, but there is no link in between that, mm. which was also quite interesting. So we took uh, two networks, uh, and one was really the linkage network, one the traffic, and there were some things Thank you. Does that input go to improve the presentation, for example, on the reading preference uh, hierarchy, you said the biographies are all-time popular. So uh, does this uh, knowledge feeds uh, uh, back into the presentation of enriching the biographies? So this is definitely a possible application uh, of this data, uh, but we don't know about this kind of application yet. So, but this is how is it normally done in other uh, on other websites, and it might be useful to use the same or the same or similar approach here as well. So the session share just left, so we have to manage our own session. I don't know if there are still questions. Okay. <laughs> yeah? So uh, I'm very happy, very appreciative for the foundation. Uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up is in the beginning of your presentation, you said that we only keep new data for 60 days. That's not true. We actually also new data for 2007. No, this is, um, sorry that I interrupt you. Um, this is what I meant on this uh, page statistics. You see the data only for the last 60 days, which is not useful at all. If you as an editor want to see uh, or want to observe a specific trends, so the recommendation we made is to extend or There are other services like Scats, uh, Profit, Z has a service. Oh yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's just an example, yes. Sure, sure. But it is a nice one because you have a beta overview about everything. So uh, this is the reason why we picked it. So, so I want to I want to ask questions about the, the uh, articles that seem to be at the wrong part of the quadrant. Uh, so, say an article that's highly popular but isn't high quality. Did you check out the trends of those articles? Could it be that the, the editors coming in to work on the article just lag behind uh, the viewers, um, so that maybe that article is very high quality now, but the, the or sorry high view right now, 
with the quality is going to boost up later once editors are pulled into the article. And it could be that readers are converting to editors exactly the way that you expect. So this was a good question. <laughs> so uh, the thing is, the metrics looked very simple, but it took us, I think, half a year uh, to really come something up that is become more stable. And we also consider uh, trends over time. And we also, what we didn't see in the, uh, one version, we uh, used uh, we had different sizes of the dots to represent how many edits you had within this year. To see, okay, the article is still short, there was a nice popularity, and there was a stable popularity, so that you, you could have just the popularity for one month, but no one is interested. So we take the media popularity over each month to see, okay, this particle was popular over one year. <laughs> then you see the note size is small, okay, nobody edited in this year. And then uh, you check uh, the article length at the end, and you see, okay, it's still short. So that's how we, we did it. We, so the data are from 2012, 2011, 2012, and we checked some articles now, and they're indeed longer, but some are still short. Mm -hmm. And there, okay, to investigate more into this, we would need to check again popularity at this time. But it's an issue anyway because you could see uh, on, the, on the other corner you had high, high profile article or high uh, quality articles, but they are not uh, interesting anymore. So maybe editors put a lot of effort because it was a, a trendy topic and now nobody's interested in it anymore. So I just want to clarify what you're saying is that that's not a problem because you use a large text language, so those, those short term trends would be pulled out a lot. Yeah. So uh, I expect you have uh, trends over more than one year. So um, uh, thank you for this lively discussion. And if you have any questions that just come, come up a little bit later, uh, of course, and ask questions, we are very happy to, to uh, show you more of our research. And uh, yeah, have a nice evening. <laughs>